Amen. It's good to be worshiping together this morning, and we need it. 2020 has been quite a year. From earthquakes to pandemics, from riots to murder hornets, (laughs) it feels like the world is unraveling at the seams. Every nerve is exposed and people are on edge. So with everything that's going around us this morning, who wants to talk about submission to governing authorities? (laughs) My guess is not many people woke up this morning and thought, you know what would be fun today? Let's talk about submission to the governing authorities. But in all seriousness, the reason that we take an expository approach to preaching is that when you preach straight through large sections of Scripture, like we're doing with the book of Romans, God sets the agenda. We don't get to conveniently avoid hard topics. And while the passage we're going to read today is both hard and unpopular, it's also very relevant. It's a word from God that we need to hear. The 18th century preacher Jonathan Edwards said that you should preach with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. He said that because the Word of God must continually be brought to bear on the events of the day. And this is even more true today when the news itself has become fragmented and polarized. News stories don't just report the facts, they're presented with an agenda leading you towards a desired response. And so if we're not going to be taken in, in one direction or the other, we need to lean upon the Word of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, we lean upon you. We lean upon your Word, and we lean upon your Spirit. Would you speak to us today, impress your truths upon our hearts, and guide us in the correct response. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me, if you like, to Romans chapter 13. I'm reading out of the older New International Version, prior to the 2011 update. That's just what my Bible happens to be. But Paul writes... Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Before we can talk about submitting to governing authorities, we need to talk about submitting to God. And not surprisingly, that's exactly what Paul has done. By the time we reach Romans 13, Paul has already worked out for us what it looks like to live in submission to God. Just a few chapters earlier, we read, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
those controlled by the sinful nature, cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. So we see that at the root of submission is a conflict of desire. In our sinful nature, we're not able to submit to God because we are being driven by our own desires. Paul says something similar in Galatians 5. He says that for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But by the power of the spirit, we're able to recognize how our own natural desires are in conflict with what God desires for us. Growing in Christian maturity is the lifelong process of learning to give up what we would naturally desire apart from God and learning to love what God desires for us. And when we do that, we realize that what God desired for us was better than what we desired for ourselves in the first place. Paul continued to work out the implications of what submission to God looks like in chapter 12, which is where we've been for the last three weeks. Three weeks ago, Pastor James talked about offering ourselves as living sacrifices, giving up ourselves. What is that if not learning to live in submission to God? Paul said that when we, that then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is for us, what God desires. Two weeks ago, Ozan talked about what submission to God looks like in the Christian community as we learn to exercise our spiritual gifts for the good of others. And then last week, Ben talked about many examples of what it looks like to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And all of that leads us up to Romans chapter 13, which is another outworking of our submission to God. So let's get into this text. And in the first five verses, Paul's going to give us six reasons that we need to submit to governing authorities. Starting in verse 1, he says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. The word for submission is hupotasso. And we're going to talk about this word a lot today. Hupo means under, and tasso means to align or to position. So to submit means to position yourself under someone else. It was a common military term used to describe the way that a soldier was positioned under the authority of a commanding officer. So here Paul says that we must position ourselves under whatever governing authority has been placed above us. Because every governing authority has been established by God. So this is the first reason for submission to government authorities. God has instituted government authorities. In Daniel 2.21, Daniel says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. So who puts kings in place? God does. And Jesus said to Pilate, you have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. So God puts them in place and gives them their authority. It includes both the position and the person. The command to submit refers to every level of government and is not dependent upon the merit, competence, or faithfulness of the one in power. This idea of aligning ourselves beneath the authority of the government has become more difficult for Christians in America over the last several decades. Because for a long time, America had been established under largely Christian principles. Our laws and our leaders, for the most part, upheld Christian values. But recently, We've watched our country slip farther and farther away from God. Many of our politicians now seem outright opposed, hostile towards God and his people. Others put on a Christian facade in order to get votes, but really have no intention of living or leading in a godly manner. 
We've seen laws change to allow and even promote sin, murder, and immorality. And it would be easy for us as Christians in America to say that this government no longer represents us or our God. So why should we live in submission to it? Surely a passage like Romans 13 no longer applies to us. Well, the flaw in this reasoning becomes obvious when we look at the context of Romans 13 and the types of political leaders that were exercising power when God inspired Paul to write these words. Here are just a few of the Roman emperors who ruled during the earthly ministry of Jesus and the life of Paul. Caesar Augustus became the first emperor and absolute ruler of the Roman Empire after his great uncle Julius Caesar was murdered in the Senate because of the fear that he had become too powerful. Augustus succeeded in consolidating, mili- consolidating political and military power. One of the ways that he did this was by publicly posting a list with the names of his political opponents. If someone could kill one of the men on the list and bring his severed head to the authorities, they would be rewarded with a share of the victim's property. So if you kill my opponents, bring me their head, I'll give you their stuff. Even if we are not satisfied with our electoral system, at least our our government is not coming to power by collecting several severed heads. It's also during the reign of Caesar Augustus that King Herod ordered the execution of every child in Judea under the age of two. Mass genocide. Tiberius assassinated his political rivals and had a reputation for killing at random. During the reign of of Tiberius, Herod the Tetrarch beheaded John the Baptist, and Pilate, the Roman procurator of Judea, gave the command to crucify Jesus. Caligula was clinically insane. He killed his own son for plotting against him, along with his own grandmother his father-in-law, and his brother-in-law. He appointed his horse as a Roman consul, and he began appearing in public dressed as various Roman gods and referring to himself as a god whom those in Rome were required to worship. He even ordered a statue of himself to be set up in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. During his reign, we see the persecution of the church in Jerusalem recorded in Acts chapter 8, and his close friend, Herod Antipas, had the Apostle James beheaded in Acts chapter 12. Following Caligula, um, Caligula was murdered, and his uncle, Claudius, who was sickly and weak, was propelled to the throne. Claudius had 35 senators and 400, 400 others executed or forced to commit suicide. He's the one who expelled the Jews from Rome in AD 52. And finally, the emperor during Paul's day was Nero, the adopted son of Claudius, who was a savage madman. He had his mother stabbed to death for treason and his wife Octavia beheaded for adultery. He's famous for the persecution of the church in which he burned Christians alive. And it was during his reign that both Peter and Paul were executed. We could go on to talk about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 or the vast persecution that broke out under the emperor Domitian, which forms the setting for the book of Revelation. But this is just a taste of the political environment in the first century. The governing authorities of Paul's time could hardly be called good leaders who upheld Christian principles and sought the good of the people. It's in this context, under these leaders, that Paul writes that we are to be subject to the governing authorities and that there's no authority, including all of the emperors that we just listed, there is no authority except that which God has put in place. So he leaves us no way out. There's no way of getting around what's being asked of us. We don't get to say, not my president, or not my governor, or I didn't vote for him. We have to understand that God has put them in place 
to serve his larger purpose, even if it's beyond what we can see or comprehend. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Let's move on to the second reason. In verse 2, Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So the second reason is that rebellion against authority is rebellion against God. We said that the word for submission was hupotasso. Here the word for rebellion is antitasso. Anti means against. So whereas hupo meant to position yourself beneath authority, antitasso means to position yourself against authority. And here we're told that to set ourselves against the government is to set ourselves against God. That's a challenging notion, isn't it? Do we understand, as Christians, that to set ourselves against our government, however much we disapprove of it, is to set ourselves against God? Now, Christians can and should find peaceful ways of making our voices heard in the political realm. We can call our representatives, we can sign petitions, we can vote our confidence, our conscience, we can run for office. All of that is working within the system to bring about positive change. And we are called to be agents of change, to be agents of peace. But we, what we can't do is to set ourselves against the government. One commentator said, the Christian community is obliged to voice its criticism of the state's failure, pointing out the deviation from the divinely ordained pattern. Subjection to the state is not to be confused with unthinking, blind, or docile conformity. But what we can't have is a rebellious or defiant spirit. And that's something that many of us in the church need to take to heart. We cannot have a rebellious or defiant spirit towards our government or its leaders. Those are hard words because there's a lot of anger and a lot of defiance going on right now. And I admit that over the last months, there's times where I have felt angry or defiant. But we're not to be a part of that. We're called to rise above it. So number one, God has instituted government authorities. Number two, rebellion against authority is rebellion against God. And the third reason is that those who rebel will receive judgment. Starting back in verse, verse 2, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. The word for judgment is krima, and in the New Testament, it's used most often to mean judgment from God. And that's the case here as well. Here, we need to understand that the judgment that is incurred by those who set themselves against the government is indeed judgment from God executed through the governing authorities whom he has instituted. If we rebel against the government and we are arrested or imprisoned or whatever the laws of the land dictate, the punishment comes as a just judgment from God. On the other hand, we're promised that if we do it as right, we will not need to fear that kind of judgment. If we do it as right, we can be free from fear of the one who is in authority. Now hold on. What about unjust governments? What about countries where Christians are doing what is right and are still being arrested or imprisoned or worse? What about China, where even today Christians are being rounded up into concentration camps like Nazi Germany? What about so many Muslim countries where entire villages of Christians are being beheaded for their faith? Let me be clear. Those forms of persecution are not a result of their wrongdoing and are not a judgment from God. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul knew what it was like to be persecuted by government officials. Paul was imprisoned, he was stoned, he was flogged, and he was executed. 
but those were not unjust, but those were unjust acts of persecution and not judgments from God. And Paul was not afraid of that kind of persecution. That's why he could say in verse 3 that he had nothing to fear. He wasn't afraid of persecution. He was afraid of God's judgment. He knew what Jesus had said in Luke 12. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And Peter says, even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. So suffering at the hands of the government because you break a law is a judgment from God and is to be feared. Unjust persecution from a government is not a judgment from God and is not to be feared. So what about those Christians who were killed by Nero? who were rounded up and fed to lions or set on fire to light his garden at night. Did Nero win? Well, let's ask it this way. Where is Nero now? And where are those Christian martyrs today? In the light of eternity, God will always have the last say. Paul's next two reasons for submission to the government come in verse 4. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. He's God's servant to do you good. So the fourth reason is that the government serves to promote good. Now virtually none of the government officials in Paul's day were Christians. And yet three times he calls them servants of God or ministers of God. And even the most cynical among us can see that we do receive positive benefits from government. Protecting individual rights, working towards education, improving public health, building transportation networks, investing in communications, building our energy supply. Whatever you think of the state of our government, we are still better off than we would be if our government vanished completely. One of the greatest benefits that we receive from the government is Paul's fifth reason, the government serves to restrain evil. He does not bear the sword for nothing. He's God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. It is the duty of those in authority to punish those who do wrong. The government is meant to be a deterrent to violence, to crime, to theft, to destruction of personal property, and to personal retribution. And honestly, Society needs that deterrent. Those who call for things like defunding the police have a naive and misguided understanding of human nature. Left to ourselves, without the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, and without the restraint of civil government, we will not altruistically work together to create a utopian society. If you want a biblical example, look at the last chapters of the book of Judges. The repeated summary in the book of Judges is, In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And the result was a downward spiral into sin and chaos. Government serves to promote good and to restrain evil. The final reason that Paul gives us is for conscience sake. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Above all these other reasons, at the end of the day, Paul wanted to know that his heart was right before God. A clean conscience was incredibly important to him. In 2 Corinthians, he writes, Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relations with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so not relying on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. So there we have Paul's reasons for submission to government authorities. We can see that he not only commanded it, but he modeled it at every juncture of his life. The final two verses are the application of this section, but 
before we get to them, we need to talk about another important aspect of submission. And perhaps this is the one that you've been waiting for this morning. We need to talk about the relationship between submission and obedience. And in particular, are there occasions in which obedience to God demands disobedience to the government? Let's start by looking at two definitions. To submit means to give over or yield the power or authority of another. To obey means to comply with or follow the commands, restrictions, wishes, or instructions thereof. So, while submission is related to obedience, submission is primarily concerned with attitude, with recognition of authority, and maintaining the proper posture towards that authority. Obedience, on the other hand, is solely concerned with action. So you can be obedient, but not submissive. And in some cases, you can be submissive even without obedience. Parents understand this. When you ask a child to do something, and they argue and complain, and they finally do what you want, but they grumble the whole way just to make sure you know that they're not happy about it, in the end, they obeyed. But there's no submission in that. Right? On the other hand, as children grow into adults, there may come a time when they are forced to follow their own conscience against the parent's desire. If they say, Mom, Dad, I understand that this is what you would have me do, and I respect that. But because of these reasons, I feel like God is leading me in another direction, and I have to follow that. There can be submission even in their disobedience because they maintain a proper sense of humbleness and respect. The distinction between these two words is so crucial. One commentator writes that Paul seems to avoid using the stronger word obey, and the reason is that the believer may find it impossible to comply with every command of the government. A circumstance may arise in which he must choose between obeying God and obeying man. But even then, he must be submissive to the extent that if his Christian convictions do not permit his obedience, he will accept the consequences of his refusal. So you've heard it said that Christians must submit to the government except when the authorities go against what God has commanded. Unfortunately, that statement is false. The command to submit to governing authorities is unqualified. The true statement would be that Christians should obey the government authorities except when the authorities go against what God has commanded. But even when the Christian is forced to disobey the government, in order to obey God, it must still be done with a submissive attitude. Does that make sense? That might be the biggest lesson for us to take away today because there, may come, there come, does come times for respectful disobedience, but there's never a cause for defiant insubordination. This also helps us understand how we can effectively relate to different levels of government when they might not be in agreement with each other. What happens when you have a constitution as your highest governing document, and then you have a president who says something that might be against the Constitution, and the governor says something that might be against what the president says. And then you have a county sheriff who says something other than, than what the governor says. You have a city mayor who says something different. You have a school board who says something different. A situation can arise in which it might be impossible to obey them all, but we can still submit to them all by recognizing their authority by listening to them thoughtfully, by speaking about them respectfully, and by turning to God for direction. That's how we navigate difficult waters. And that's why submission to God is so important. That's why Paul starts with submission to God. We need to begin by setting aside what we want and pursuing what God wants because if we don't, when we're faced with decisions about how to respond to a command, we're really responding out of our own sinfulness. We might cloak it in Christian language and throw out a Bible verse, 
But really, our response is guided by our own fear, indignation, laziness, desire for independence, you name it. And then, after we've already decided what to do, we look for justification from the Bible to defend our viewpoint. YouTube is a perfect example of this. On the one hand, YouTube is great because you can find a, a video to help you fix anything. When I had to replace a heating element in my dryer, YouTube. When, I had to, when we decided to build a retaining wall, YouTube. When Danny and I wanted to epoxy a live edge table, YouTube. But here's the problem. You can also find a YouTube video claiming to offer biblical support for anything you want to believe. And they almost always use terrible exegesis. They twist and distort scripture, but we were ready to eat it up because it supports what we have already decided to believe. So let's be done with that nonsense. Here is a true and trustworthy saying. No one has ever won an argument on Facebook. The people who already agree with you will like your post, and the people who disagree will share their own videos, and everyone gets more entrenched in what they've already chosen to believe. We need to begin by submitting our own desires to God, and then we can see where his desires might lead us into submissive disobedience. And the clearest example of what I'm calling submissive disobedience is in Acts chapters 4 and 5. In Acts 4, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin. It says they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. The apostles understood that their calling was to preach the gospel. And they could not obey an order to desist. But they did so with as much reverence and respect as possible. In chapter 5, they're brought back and they're flogged for their disobedience. They accepted their flogging. And it says that they left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. We as a church need to understand that our mission is not to get distracted by arguments about all of the smaller issues. This year, the elders have spent countless hours in prayer and discussion seeking God's direction for the church. We know that we are fallible and that people are going to disagree with some decisions. But I hope that everyone can see and understand that the motivation behind everything that we do at CCBC has always been accomplishing God's mission for his church, to preach the gospel, to reach the lost, and to build up the body of Christ. And we do that with an attitude of respect towards our government officials and kindness to everyone in our community. That's what we're here for. Finally, let's move briefly into uh, Paul's application. He gives us two things, but I'm going to add a third. First of all, he says, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servant who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. The words tax and revenue both fall under what we mean by the one word taxes. The first word refers to a tribute paid to a ruler, and the second refers to fees or levies that come about as a result of conducting business. But the point is clear. Paying taxes is the direct and unavoidable duty of the Christian. There's no justifiable way around it. Pay your taxes. Secondly is respect. The final two words here warrant a little bit more discussion. The word translated respect is phobos, which literally means fear. But here a better understanding of the word would be reverence. We're to re have reverence towards our governing authorities. Again, this speaks about our attitude. We need an attitude of reverence. Well, the final word, honor, refers towards our actions. Simply put, we owe the government our respect in our thoughts, in our words, 
and in our actions, plain and simple. At the moment, we have a Republican president and a Democratic governor. Both are fairly polarizing individuals, so chances are you disagree with at least one, if not both of them. We as Christians are still called to speak respectfully about them, and that includes Facebook. And I think some of us might need to go home today and clean up the way that we have been speaking. Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and aliens, to abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Pay taxes. Show respect. And finally, elsewhere, Paul adds a third application, which is prayer. In 1 Timothy Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all those in authority, that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. In prayer, we not only show respect to the government authorities by seeking their good, but we also humble ourselves and foster an attitude of submission. So this morning, we're going to end our time by inviting a few of our elders to come forward and lead us in a time of prayer for our government. Our God, we thank you for your love for us, for this uh, country that you've placed us in, Lord, that uh, given so much opportunity and so much uh, good things, Lord. Lord, there's also things that uh, in our heart we're uh, conflicted about. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to uh, submit to you. Lord, you, you know our hearts. Lord, help us to continue to want to serve you, not to dwell on uh, the mess that Satan is, is trying to stir up within us. Lord, help us to glorify you, to continue to give you the glory for what you're going to do and what you have done in our lives because of your son, Jesus. For the uh, way that you you can direct us if we submit ourselves to you, Lord. Keep our eyes on you, Lord. Help us not to uh, try to antagonize governmental decisions, Lord, but to to honor you, uh, allow you to lead our lives. Lord, I pray that you just help us as a church body to continue to uh, look to you for the, the, the total authority, Lord, of who you are, even over the government and all that you have placed over us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, As you've given Timothy the words to give to us, we are commanded to pray for our leaders, 
And in your word, you have told us that you change the heart of the king like a river. And so we, we bring our leaders before you, Lord. I pray for President Trump. I pray for congressmen and women. I pray for Governor Inslee and for the, the legislators, for our county councils and, and the local leaders, that you would guide their hearts, that you would guide them like a river, Lord. I pray that you would give them wisdom to make decisions that honor you. And we know that some of those decisions will not honor you. And I pray that you would change their hearts. And as Pastor PJ has, has preached, that you would work in our hearts to submit, to honor, Lord, to glorify you, to further your kingdom so that those who may disagree with us can see our actions and praise you. Lord, we want them to see you and to glorify you and to come to know you. And I pray that you would bring that about. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.